So I would like us to think through expectations for a long journey. Maybe it's you thinking about going to see family once the COVID restrictions ease a bit. Maybe it's traveling abroad. Maybe it's going to see other cousins. Whatever it is, what is it that you tend to do when you go for a long journey? We seek to make the journey as easy as possible, right? For example, we try and travel when there's less traffic. Or if you're like me, you've got your podcast playlist ready, you've got your water, or you've got your wife on the side giving you snacks while you're driving. And if you're really keen, maybe when you're going abroad, you're choosing the comfortable seat for your flight. But why do we go through all that effort? It's because we understand that journeys are difficult, and especially when we have not prepared for them. And in particular, if we don't put these things in place, it's more likely we get frustrated or irritated along the journey. So we just try to make the journey as smooth as possible by putting these things in place. So today we are looking at numbers 10 and 11 and the Israelites are beginning their journey and there is no way of making the road ahead any easier. They simply have to follow and trust God's guidance in the wilderness. Their journey is not one of simply finding their way to the promised land, but it is a journey of how they follow God. And that journey presents things that we should learn in our own journey if we seek to follow God. So as we look at their journey of following God, I'm hoping we'll see the following three points in the sermon. The first point is following God should make us pray. The second point is following God will test our love for people. And the third point is following God will test our true desires. So the first point, following God should make us pray. And to look at this, I'll be looking at Numbers 10, verse 35 to 36. And Anna, you can put that up on the first slide if you can. And it says this, Whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Rise up, Lord. May your enemies be scattered. May your foes flee before you. Whenever it came to rest, he said, return, Lord, to the countless thousands of Israel. Thank you, Anna. So from these verses, the first thing I want to highlight is that Moses was aware of the battles ahead. Moses was aware of the Lord's plan to take the Israelites to a promised land. At the same time, he knew it was not going to be easy. When Moses asked the Lord to rise up and let the enemy scatter, we learn here that Moses knew he needed the Lord's strength. The, anim the enemies weren't going to go away peacefully, but they needed the Lord's intervention for them to go. To provide some context, it's important to consider what Moses and the Israelites are doing before Moses says these words. The Israelites are being led by Moses and they're not following God through a map of any kind or walking aimlessly. We see in the previous chapters that they know their way because when the cloud lifts, they know they are to walk and follow God. And when it rests, the Israelites camp and rest. And there was no time limit to that too. So the Israelites could have been camping for weeks, months, or years. So there was no being left hung out to dry. The Israelites knew that the Lord was with them. They were following him day by day. Now, in that situation, when you are physically seeing God so close, what is making Moses make such a request? It wouldn't be a stretch to say that by walking with God so slowly, so closely, Moses should expect God to scatter the enemies. And yet he still makes this request. This is something we can see in our own relationships. When we have our own close relationships with people, we don't ask our friends or our family to do the obvious. For example, if you are babysitting for a friend, the friend will, will never ask you, or I hope they don't ask you, keep the children safe. Because due to the nature of the relationship, it's what's expected. So asking God to rise and enemies to scatter is a strange request because Moses should not expect otherwise from God because the Lord will not forget to do that. But yet, Moses still takes time to thoughtfully make this request. So what does that show us? 
It shows us that there's never a point where asking God to move in your life, to help you in your battles, is a waste of your time. It isn't because God is a robot we control through our prayers. Rather, God chooses to bring about his change through our prayers. He invites us to rely on him for us to see his faithfulness through our prayers. God shows us he can be trusted by giving us the gift of prayer. But the call here is not to just simply pray. We need to understand why we need to pray. A reason why we should pray that is seen here is knowing that there's a real enemy ahead. Moses knew the battles ahead were real and that they were going to be difficult. He knew the Lord had enemies and he needed the Lord's intervention for them to go away. And I think the reason why some of us are so prayerless is because we have lost sight of our enemy. We have lost sight of our battles. Maybe it's the case of the pandemic that we are more at home, we feel more shielded. But the Bible tells us that we do have an enemy. First Peter 5 says that the devil is prowling around like a, prowling, like a roaring lion. And if any of you have seen or watched how a lions hunt their prey, it's fascinating. They stalk out their prey, they lay low, and when their prey shows a lapse of concentration or looks away, what do the lions do? They pounce. And that's how our enemy is working. So no matter how long we stay at home, no matter how safe we feel, that truth still remains. The devil is lying in wait. He wants to take away your desires from God. And he's happy to patiently wait for you to show a moment of weakness. So the fact is, there is a battle. There is an enemy who is seeking to stop us from loving and serving the Lord. Therefore, we ought to pray, even in times when we delight in God, when we think we are strong, because we need the Lord's strength to resist the devil and his schemes. Another reason why we should pray is because of the promise of eternal life for those who trust in Jesus Christ. We aren't like the Israelites. We are not following God into a land as such, but we are following God, trusting he will lead us to eternal life. We and the Israelites are following and trusting God for a future promise. Therefore, knowing the beauty of heaven to come should give us a desire to pray so that we can faithfully follow God there. By knowing that there is a place reserved for us because we have trusted God in our sins, knowing that there is a place where we will see God face to face and there will be suffering no more, should fill us with joy and should fill us with a desire to pray. So we ought to pray to resist the temptations that will seek to set aside that truth that would make it seem like rubbish news. We should pray so we grow in the promise that God has given us. Often our prayerlessness is because we have not thought through much about eternal life. And for some of us, eternal life does not give us any real joy or excitement. It seems too far away. And the last thing I want us to remember here is that Jesus thought it was fitting to pray. In the Gospels, we see that in the darkest moments, Jesus prayed. In the Garden of Gethsemane, as he considered the cross, Jesus thought it was necessary to pray to the God as he followed his plan for him on the cross. Jesus also teaches us in the Lord's Prayer that we should pray, let your will be done, and for us to not be led into temptation. And that itself echoes Moses' prayer. It's a prayer that acknowledges our enemy, and more importantly, acknowledges God's ability to deliver us from the enemy. So we have confidence that Jesus has answered Moses' prayer here because he has defeated death, hell, and Satan on the cross. So we see here that Jesus prayed, Moses prayed, and we should pray too. Following God has to be a life which is filled with prayer. And if this is something you struggle with, 
don't leave it alone. Ask someone in church to pray with you. Ask our pastors to pray with you. Ask someone in your community group to pray with you. Seek many moments to pray, not because it's an activity that you should just do, but it's because it's what we truly need as we follow God and trust him with our lives. Our lives should be a life of prayer. So that was my first point. My second point is following God will test our love for people. And I'm reading that from Numbers 29 to 32. So Anna, if you could put the next slide. It says this. Now Moses said to Hobab, son of Reol, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, we are setting out for the place about which setting out for, about which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us and we will treat you well. For the Lord has promised good things to Israel. He answered, no, I will not go. I'm going back to my own land and my own people. But Moses said, please do not leave us. You know where we should camp in the wilderness and you can be our eyes. If you come with us, we will share with you whatever good things the Lord gives us. Thank you, Anna. The first thing I want to mention on this point is that our love for people will be tested because we will be challenged to see whether we will see what God sees. And I base that on this interaction between Moses and Hobab. We learn in Numbers 10 that Hobab is a foreigner, so he has no interest in going where the Israelites are going out. But Moses pleads for him to not leave. Moses says two things. He says Hobab can be their eyes and that he will share whatever good things the Lord gives. Moses sees what God sees by saying, you can be our eyes. Moses knew that the Israelites needed someone like Hobab and that it would benefit the wider group. They needed someone as a lookout and Hobab was the person. This is a challenge for us because it should make us think how good are the relationships we have within our own church family? It challenges us to think of two things. The first thing, what are the gifts within our own church family? And the second thing, what gifts do we need in our church family? Moses had to have known that for the Israelites in order to know there was a need for eyes amongst the Israelites. And some of you may be thinking, that it was easy because Moses was in a leadership position. So he should know what the Israelites need. And to an extent, that is true. But it does not make the job any easier. There were literally thousands of Israelites with Moses. But Moses still knew what they needed. So for us, the argument should not be that this is Moses' job and it does not apply to us. The fact is, it should be all of our jobs to know what our church family needs. So I have a question for you. What is fellowship like with those around you? Do we only know people by their names or do we have meaningful relationships? If a hobab popped up in our church and said they were going to leave and go to their people, what would be your argument to persuade them to stay? Would you have a word of encouragement for them? If you would not, maybe that shows we are not loving people as well as we think we are. Following God will test our love for people because it means we have to share our lives with others. The Christian cannot just focus on themselves. Moses was not wrapped up in the promised land that he forgot about Hobab. Moses was going to share what the Israelites had with Hobab. This shows us our following of God compels us to love others because it's how God functions himself. He has created a place in heaven for us and it is to be shared with his people. We cannot follow him and not be willing to love his people and share what he has given us with others. And the second way our love for people will be tested is by our ability to deal with each other's sins. And I want to read Numbers 11, verse 10 to 15 about this. So, Anna, you can put it on the slide, please. 
it says this moses heard the people of every family wailing at the entrance to their tents the lord became exceedingly angry and moses was troubled he asked the lord why have you brought this trouble on your servant what have i done to displease you that you put the burden of all these people on me did i conceive all these people did i give them birth why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised an oath to their ancestors where can i get meat for all these people they keep wailing to me give us meat to eat i cannot carry all these people by myself the burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you're going to treat me, please go ahead and kill me right now. If I have found favor in your eyes and do not let me face my own ruin. Thank you, Anna. Moses wanted to be struck dead by God when he saw the sin and the frustration of the Israelites. He really and truly despised the role that God had given him. And in all real senses, Moses wanted out and he wanted out quickly. And I previously said that we have to share our lives with people. And these verses show us that it's not going to be an easy task. It's going to bring its difficulties. Being close with others as you follow God means you will see the sin in one another a lot more. And then we are going to be faced with the choice. Whether we're going to have this initial reaction Moses had and went out or be patient. Moses' reaction here isn't one to emulate, but it is to show us that these may be real emotions we face. And we have to think through how we're going to be able to deal with situations when we are faced with one another's sins. The Lord wants us to be drawn to patience with each other, even as our sins are exposed. Because the truth is, every Christian is precious to the Lord. It's important to think through as well, in this reaction, God did not listen to Moses' request and strike him dead. But he gave him 70 elders to assist him to lead the people. And we see that in verse 17. And what does that show us? This shows us that the Lord, whilst he calls us to love his people, and he knows it will be testing, he will give us the means to bear with it. Now, it won't necessarily be the 70 elders that Moses had, but he has promised us fruits of the spirit to love his people. The same spirit given to the 70 elders will be with us in the fruits of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. So following God will test our love for his people, but he will give us all that we need to pass the test. We do not need to fear failing. And my third and final point is following God will test your true desires. And to start this point, I want to first look at Numbers 11, verse 1 to 6. So I don't know if you could put that on the slide, please. It says this. Now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And when, he had, and when he heard them, his anger was aroused. Then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. When the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord and the fire died down. So that place was called Tibera because fire from the Lord had burned among them. The rabble with them began to crave other foods. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manner. Thank you, Anna. It was at this point that the Israelites slowly started getting itchy feet. So far, we see that they had, far they had been obediently following the Lord through the clouds, setting up camp as God wanted. However, God's order of things started to really grate on them. It was at this point that they started reminiscing of times when they even were in slavery, 
because they were imagining the food they used to eat. They were tired of the manna that God had provided. They wanted meat. So how does this show following God will test our desires? Following God will test our desires because it makes us deal with the question, why have we chosen to follow God? Is it because we desire him or are we just going to go through the motions? Because mere passion at the point of deciding to follow God is okay, but this will fizzle out. The long and difficult Christian journey exposes what is in our hearts. And this is what we are starting to see with the Israelites. It's also important that we tread carefully here when we look at the Israelites. Because it's easy for us to look at them and think, what's wrong with you? God is literally with you. Just shut up, be obedient, follow him. Just be thankful. But we have to approach this passage with humility. There's more of the Israelites in us than we first think. For a minute, I want you to consider if the tables were turned and the Israelites were reading a Bible that showed our journey following God. What do you think their reaction would be? They would re read our story, which would detail how we have evidence of Christ dying and rising for the rising for the de from the dead to free us from our sins. We have Bibles in almost every house. We see God's grace by the fact that we can visit churches as we freely want to. Bearing all of that in mind, do not some of us find ourselves murmuring, God, I want more. God, I want something different. God, this is not what I want. Take me back to 2019 where things were good. So maybe the Israelites will look at our lives and have a similar reaction to what we have when we re first read Numbers 11. Saying all of that, that does not mean we have to have a robotic response to difficulty or a fake one either. The Lord knows when we go through difficulty. He is the one who often tests us. But what particularly displeased God here was the Israelites' aimless complaints. They were not going to God with their difficulty. So God is not displeased with us when we come to him seeking for help or when we come to him when we find things hard or frustrating. But he cannot stand the grumbling. It dishonors him and it puts him out of the picture. We take him out of this picture of dealing with our troubles. So in essence, we disregard him. So following God, Having Christ as our saviour is not a journey. It's not an easy journey. And anyone who says otherwise is lying. The passage serves as a warning that our hearts will be exposed. We have to want the Lord for himself. Otherwise, we may find ourselves soon grumbling. So I've said that following God can expose our sinful desires. So what happens if these sinful desires go unchecked? I want us to read Numbers 11, verse 31 to 34. And if you put it on the slide, please. It says this. Now a wind went out from the Lord and drove quail in from the sea. It scattered them up to two cubits, deep all around the camp, as far as a day's walk in any direction. All that day, and night and all the next day, the people went out and gathered quail. No one gathered less than 10 homers. Then they spread them out all around the camp. But while the meat was still between their teeth and before it could be consumed, the anger of the Lord burned against the people and he struck them with a severe plague. Therefore, the place was named Kibroth Hatava because there they buried the people who had craved other food. Thank you, Anna. So from this passage, we see that the Lord is not impartial to the Israelites, wanting someone else above him. The Israelites' true desire was a craving for other food, a craving for something else other than God. This brought judgment from God and they were killed. So what does that teach us? The first thing I think it teaches us, God wants us to put him center. 
So whenever we are making plans, whenever we want to pursue our desires, we should be asking ourselves, does this put God at the center or does this put me at the center? The me the Israelites wanted wasn't bad. God created it. But it's that they were putting themselves at the center, craving something else other than God. Putting their pleasures first. Remembering putting God at the center is not something that should be forgotten. Stu taught us a few weeks back that the camp was arranged around the tabernacle to precisely make this point. So we should regularly ask ourselves, are we out of balance here? Have we lost the focal point of God? We should regularly pause and ask God what he would have us do with our desires. And the second thing I, le- I think we learn here is that our own wisdom can damn us. So often we think we know what is the right thing to do. We know what's best for our grandchildren. We know what's best for our children. We know what's best for the schools that our kids can go. We know what's, what's healthy to eat. We know what's unhealthy to eat. We know what will make our relationships better. But Numbers 11 forces us to make us think, actually, maybe we do not know everything at all. We have a verse in Isaiah 55 which says, the Lord's thoughts are not our thoughts. And this passage really screams that out to us. It could be that the things we think are right and good for us could actually lead to our demise. The Israelites thought just a little bit of meat is just what they needed in addition to following God. Yet that little bit is what God used to execute his judgment. So therefore, that little bit extra you think would help you follow God. Be very careful with it. That might be the very thing that that will lead you away from God. God may be keeping it from you so that your heart remains with him. So rather rather than putting your hope and your desires, put your hope in God. Hold on to your desires loosely. Rather than pursuing your desires by any means, regularly submit them to God. Shape them by his word. Bring it to him in prayer. So what do we make of all this then? God has not given us numbers 10 and 11 to say, look, I've caught you out now and I'm about to take you on a rough ride. No, he he brings us numbers 10 and 11 to show us what lies ahead. He has not left us to fret about what we need to do. In all these things we have mentioned, Jesus has done it perfectly. Jesus prayed whilst he was on this earth and he prays for us now. Jesus loves people more than we ever could and his true desire is to glorify the Father. So we are in good company when we think about the points of this sermon. So therefore, let our response be look to Jesus, follow his path as we see in scripture. He has followed God perfectly and whilst we won't all the time, he will give us every ounce of strength needed as we seek to walk as Jesus walked. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for Numbers 10 and 11. Thank you that you show us and that, that this journey that we have with you is long and it will be difficult, but you have not left us alone. When Moses despaired, you gave him the elders. Lord, when we despair, Lord, you give us Christ. You show us that he is able to walk with us every step of the journey. So, Lord, whilst this journey will expose what is in our heart, whilst it may bring about sin, such as showing us how unthankful we are, I just pray that, Lord, you will keep us and that we will follow you, that we will look to Jesus for strength. And, Lord, we just thank you that you show us our true desires and not leave us there because you want us to be more like Christ. So, Lord, let us be encouraged today that you are with us. And as we seek to follow you, Lord, I pray that you'll give us faith to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.